let me not open a new terminal yet again. I will go back to the course page. I'll choose the Python basics notebook. I'll right click on that, copy link address, and I will double you get that. Now you should see a new notebook, which you can click on. And I will just run this thing again to make the page wider. Right, so the, um, the metadata is still the same. The, this particular tutorial is heavily inspired and adapted from the whirlwind tour of Python by Jake Vanderplas. And it's meant to be a tutorial for people who are programmers, who know how to program in an A language. And it's written in a way so as not to um, make you sit through mindless faff about what programming language is, what a variable is. It just grabs you by the hand and sprints with you. So if you feel that this isn't enough for you, what we chose from this tutorial, you can just go there and you can see actually something nice about Jupyter Notebooks, which I can show you here. It's the fact that this site right here is actually Jupyter Notebook rendered in HTML. You'll recognize the markdown, which for some reason are being rendered in a weird way, but um, I can open this particular page and its errors and exceptions. And this is actually a Jupyter notebook that is run, that, that is rendered as HTML. So you don't actually have the kernel like we do in our environment, but you can record your experiments and generate a blog post out of them or whatever you feel like. So yeah. If you go to the GitHub, you can probably see the, yeah, there we go. These are the actual IPython notebooks that generated the website. And if we open them in GitHub, GitHub will actually render them. So this is the same interface that we have, but you can see it rendered in HTML, which is also what we would like you to submit your assignments as. Once you're finished, or am I mistaken here, Michael? Do we want iPython no, notebooks right. or do we want? We want HTML because that is what Moodle universally supports as uh, okay. the files. So once you're done with your assignments, just restart the kernel and run everything and then export that to HTML. Okay, let's go back here. So again, very highly recommended. If you already know Python and just want to jump into scientific Python, so SciPy, NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, and things we will cover it in due time, not today. Today we'll only look at the standard library and basic functionality. You can also have a look at, again, Python for Data Analysis by uh, the author of Pandas or the Python Data Science Handbook, both of which are freely available, both code and text. So again, to the uh, obligatory Wikipedia excerpt. These are the things that you'll hear all the time. If, if the fact that Python is an interpreted high level and general purpose programming language doesn't mean anything to you, then that's all right. You'll get an intuition of what that means as you use it. The fact that it's so forgiving, that it's duct type, meaning that it will try to do things and if it fails, it'll tell you it fails. It won't forbid you from doing anything. You can define whatever you want, change what you defined. And that makes it partly the language of choice for machine learning because you want something to, to go into the background. You don't want any overhead in terms of typing in terms of having to think about what the language wants, but you want a language like Python that just gives you what you want and you can be free to think about the algorithms that we want you to implement. 
Um, it was created by Guido van Rossum, who has earned the nickname Benevolent Dictator for Life. So if you Google BDFL, you'll probably see a picture of him. What the Benevolent Dictator for Life does is if there are fights, if there are disagreements, he usually has the last words, last word. Now, Python is dynamically typed and garbage collected. So this might mean something to you if you come from Java. If you come from something like C, this will be a very um, forgiving language in terms of that. So it might have affected the performance, but let's not worry about that too much. Um, if you look up tutorials, a Stack Overflow, um, questions, you often see some question being rejected, uh, some answer being rejected as unpythonic, even though it works, because there's this thing in the Python community about making things look pretty, about using everything that the language lets you use, and just keep in mind that some people will look down on the way you write things. Now, finally, um, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of a PEP, which is how Python evolves, often in huge open source projects. You'll have um, proposals, people, anyone, you can, I can, propose some feature that I think fits well with the Python um, philosophy and just see how it goes. So most of the features that we have access to now have at some point been some sort of proposal and pep zero is the proposal that started the fact that we propose things a particular pep that i'd like to draw your attention to is what's called the zen of python it's just um well let me run this command which is a nice easter egg in the python language whatever you use python you'll get this now this isn't an explicit way to do things it's just general philosophies that are useful not only in Python, but like in other technical things. Um, explicit is better than implicit. Python is so forgiving that sometimes it will make it easy for you to write things that aren't easy to be read by other people. So keep that one in mind, for example. Simple is better than complex. Complex is better than complicated. So just if you feel that there are more than ways to do one thing, just import this and be inspired. Um, any questions till now? There is a question. Should we use Jupyter nodes for exercise sheet one? You, uh, you can. So uh, even for answering the uh, theory questions, uh, you can use the markdown capabilities in the, in the notebook. I think we, we expect actually PDF file uploads, but we can also allow HTML for all questions if you want to write your answers that way, that's fine. Or you could, and that's also because there is LaTeX capability, you can download a PDF and it will take a minute to render the PDF, iPhone tutorial, and it will be rendered Right. Slightly different. This, this only works, however, if you have a LaTeX installation on the machine which, where you're running. The yes, notebook. which would be and the I case if you use the Docker file that we, the, the Docker image we provide, or the the Jupyter server that we provide. If not, then you would have to, like Michael said, um, take care of downloading LaTeX. Okay, cool. How are we doing on time? Um, we have theoretical uh, theoretically until 3 p.m. So there's no need to rush at all. <laughs> okay, I mean, like so, I said, um, okay. Can we uh, interrupt quickly for something? So I, I suggested in the chat that people look at the source code for the this module that you just imported. So in the notebook, for example, you can type this followed by two question marks to see it. It's actually rather short. Maybe you can quickly do this. I have Is never it? thought about that. Yeah, I'm interested in seeing. <laughs> it is a little bit encrypted. 
That's super Another Easter egg, perhaps. A meta Easter egg. So this cell demonstrate was what is typically meant by Python is dynamically typed. Um, like we said, lines in a cell are executed sequentially. So in sequence, we can run x equals one, x equals one dot, x equals a string and x equals a list. And Python won't complain because it'll just X is just a container and and it's just pointing. It's not really pointing, but a good mental image to think about if you if you want to compare it to things like C is to think of like a pointer to a value and the name is just not important. And one thing to keep in mind since the standard implementation of Python is in C, C Python not to be confused with the Cypon, which is something different. A Python integer, like x equals one, and if we run the function type of one, which is an int, a Python integer is not really like a, an integer the way we understand it, in, in, like, like a normal C integer, but it's rather a struct that contains a lot of things, and it has to contain all this overhead in order to make it as malleable as we see here. Another interesting thing is that everything is an object, even functions, and they're typed as well. So x1 is a int, it's a float, now it's a string, and now it's a list. And since everything's an object, that means that everything probably has methods and to figure out what sort of methods an object has, and that is particularly useful when you are running um, code that you find on GitHub that isn't documented, that doesn't have doc strings, and instead of reading the source code, you can just import a specific function or object or what have you and run dir on it, and it will tell you the methods available. So if we choose copy, and if we're interested in that, we can introspect Now the difference between interrogation and double interrogation is that double interrogation will try to get you the source code, but that only works if it's written in Python. So the thing Michael show, uh, showed us, which is the this double interrogation, and it showed us the source code that only works because this is written in Python, but most things are written in C. So we won't have access to the source code before it was compiled. Um, one thing to pay attention to is when you do something like x is a list and y equals x, what both y and x are basically ref referring to the same object. The important thing is here, it's this object here that we're giving the label x to. And when we do this, then y is also referring to that. So when I append an element to a list and print y, then y is also changed. Now this is different because, again, since this is just a label, I'm reassigning the label to a different object. So Y hasn't changed. Okay, so we have taken a few tables from the whirlwind. There's another Python. question. Um, yeah. Chris. Go what ahead. if I don't want y to change if I change the value in x? Then you would, that's quite a coincidence because I randomly chose copy and you would run the copy command, which is available on most Python objects that you will encounter. This will be important to do, for example, in pandas and data frames when we want to just 
take a subset of the data frame because some modules won't change things but return a different view on the item so if you choose a smaller data frame it's not that the data frame becomes smaller it's that you have a, a restricted view on the same object and if you want to play around with it you will better have copied it before you do that so yeah. you have to be a bit careful if this is a nested dictionary you need to use the deep copy module instead otherwise mm -hmm. you just get a shallow copy oh okay good to know so the, the the topmost dictionary will be copied but everything inside would not be a copy okay And oh, you can also use a, a cast operation for shallow copies. So dict and then yeah. or list and then in parentheses mm -hmm. the object. Okay, I see. So so using list as a sort of yeah. constructor then. Yep, same thing. Thank you, Yannick. Okay, so uh, uh, there was another question. Do we yep. have access to this particular document? You mean the notebook that Chris is, sh is sharing? Then yes, this is already linked from the course web page. You can download it. If you go there. to today's date and you have the Jupyter tutorial and you have the, the current tutorial that we're on, which is the Python one. And if you run wget in the Jupyter server that we provide for you, then you can just download it and open it and follow along if you want. I will not spend too much time on this because you will know most of these from uh, whatever programming language you're coming from. There are seven basic binary arithmetic operators, addition, subtraction, and the rest. And it works just as you would expect it to work. You can run Boolean, op Boolean operations using AND or, or NOT. So pay attention to the fact that equals is the assignment operator and double equal is the Boolean test is equal to. And both these things are true, so the result is true. You can also add not to negate things. This is true because C isn't equal to five, it's equal to three. When you have more of these together, better use parentheses. And I'll refer you to the, I don't remember which part of the Zen of Python it was, but explicit is always better than implicit. Always use parentheses when there's a chance that something will go wrong because a lot of times in Python, you'll have an error in the results and you won't know why. It's because the interpreter is very permissive. A lot of things are allowed to happen and that has good thing, good sides and bad sides. And the bad sides are when something goes wrong and you can't tell where it is. Just be explicit and hopefully you'll avoid these sort of errors. Quick interruption, Chris, an audience member is asking to explain again what you did with uh, this double interrogation. Yeah. So the interrogation or double interrogation allows you to introspect an object. Now, the double interrogation specifically provides you the source code of an object. Let me define a function, for example, define function, even though we don't know how to define a function, define function of a equals x plus x squared, return a. Now, if I run fun double interrogation, it will give me the source code of this function, but only because it's written in Python because I just wrote it. But the copy command, which is also a, a function available in Python, 
is not written in Python. It's written in C. It's a built-in function. And as such, we don't have access to the source code because the source code is compiled and that's how some things are, so, are fast enough to be usable. So the example that Michael gave us was the, this. If you remember earlier, okay, we, we imported the, this module and what it did is printed out this piece of text. And since this obviously is written in Python, not in C, we can do something like this question mark, question mark, and it will give us the source code. So it's defining a string, garbled, encrypted. I don't want to say encrypted because this is just substitution, I suppose. Right. So if you're using APIs that are written in Python, and a lot of, a lot of them are, then you can run double interrogation, but if there's nothing to return, then it will default to the description of the function. Now, the, my function has no description, so if I run just one question mark, it will say it has no doc string, and the doc string is just a way to define documentation as a comment inside a function. Does that answer the, the question? Please let us know if you have further questions, of course. All right. Um, I didn't plan on this, but there is something um, peculiar to Python. It's the concept of truthy and falsely and it's 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 odd if you're not used to it but there are things in in the types that default to false like for example the integer um zero so a equals zero that's an integer right and if we run the boolean constructor on a that defaults to false and so we can run if a which is an integer, but again, zero is a falsy value, so it defaults to false. And this if is basically in the background, just converting it to a Boolean and running bool A. And if A was the non object of none type, it would also def default to false. And this is usually used in a way quite often because you can, you can create tests on whether or not something exists and act according to that. Uh, if, if you have an empty list, that is also a falsy thing. But if you have a list with at least one element, even if it's zero, that's true, because it has an element in it. So you can do things like if list, and if it's false, then it doesn't exist, then you can append to it, and things like that. These are things that will become more familiar to you once you start writing code and you start needing things like that. Um, also extremely useful are identity and membership operators. You can define a list, run b equals a, and as we saw earlier, they both refer to the same actual list. So if I run b is a, that is true. But if this time I define a different object, even though it's the same one as an actually physically different one, B is no longer A. I can test membership. Is the integer one in the list one, two, three? It is. Is the string foo in one, two, three? It isn't. It could be because lists don't care what's in them. And I can use the not keyword or any of the Boolean keywords that we saw. 
By default, Python supports all of these scalar types. All of them are objects, complex, bool, float, int, and string. Um, I'm not sure if there are any questions in general about scalar types, but if there aren't, I can just demonstrate quickly the complex type that you will never use in your life. I can see what methods there are, or members rather, x conjugate. It's a function. Therefore, I have to call it x.real. Whoops. That is not a function, it seems. Yep, indeed. That is not a function. That is a float, and as such, it's not callable. And if I run tab, I can see the three available members that X can call. Another question regarding the equality tests. So A is B will only be true if both B and A are the same and will be false even if A and B have similar values. Correct, that is correct. Similar means the same. Yes. Otherwise it would always be false. <laughs> now if, if, if uh, good point. If I let me print this, since we saw that only the last thing is displayed. If I run b is a, it's false. But if I run b is equal to a in terms of value, then that's obviously true. So even yeah. though they don't refer to the same object, they still contain the same value. Mm -hmm. Um, only the order of execution matters. So if I do define, so the context of that is that of the cell here. So I couldn't inside the same cell call a function and then define it. But if I define a function, function two, and that prints I am function two, the statement isn't quite correct though. Um, you cannot call a function and then define it, but if you have two functions and you call one from the other, then the other doesn't matter because the execution context is after the definition. Oh, and if that was the question, then yes, I would defer to Yannick here, but what I, I thought the question was, if I run this cell, can I call function two on top of it? And yes. that I can do. Um, you can hear because you already executed the other cell. Yeah. And of course, you when you submit order. your notebooks, um, you should keep them in the order so that it runs from start to finish without yeah. errors. So, so, so if oh, yeah, you rerun the kernel now, it will run. Yeah, let's, let's try that. Let me just start everything. Um, There we go. Function two is not yet defined because chronologically, if it's running from scratch, then it, it can't have run this cell. So. Okay, we can now move on to the four main data structures that you will use, or probably not use because at some point we'll introduce NumPy arrays and pandas data frames and you will not use lists as much. It's still useful to have a look. You can define lists in Python, which is an ordered collection, a tuple, which is similar to a list, but it's immutable. Once you define it, you cannot change the values. You can 
define a dictionary or a hash table, which is an unordered key value mapping? Uh, it is ordered now. Yeah, starting 5.3.6, 3. 6. Yeah. I think it's there, there is an ordering guarantee in terms of the order of creation, like of insertion, but there is no inherent ordering here. So it could be A, C, B, and the ordering would be A, C, B, and you could be guaranteed to, to, to get that back. So yeah. And just to double check what version of Python we're running, we can import the sys module. And in that, there is sys.version we can call, and that will give us the version of Python we are running, so. The set is always ordered though. It says unordered here. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Oops. So if you define it as three, two, one, it's the same set. It's the one, two, three, if you print it. Yeah, I suppose. It's a matter I of suppose define ordered, right? Yeah, semantically. You, you can, you can um, compare different orders and they're the same. But uh, if you print the object itself, it always has the same order. That's how the yeah. comparison works. Yeah. But in, mm. in, this, in this sense, we mean that it preserves the order in which you um, add objects to it, right? And the set doesn't do that. So that's so why. It doesn't do that, no. So an example of defining a list, we've seen that a couple of times. You can call functions on that. And this is a function, this isn't a method of, of, the, of, of the list as such, but rather a function that you can call on random, not random, but on Python objects that support it. A string supports the same length method a set, anything that you can iterate over. So if we call length on that, that's four. We can append to the list and that will actually change the list itself, which means that the list is mutable. You couldn't run things like that on a tuple because a tuple is immutable. You can use addition to concatenate lists. You can use the sort method of the list itself to sort in place, you can have different types inside a list. So we have a list of that contains an integer, a string, a float, and another list. Now let's redefine our list as this one here. We can access it by indexing. It's zero indexed, like you're probably used to. So zero referring to the first element, one referring to the second element. Minus one would refer to the last element. So it wraps around, which is 11 in this case. Minus two would refer to the seventh element, etc. You can also slice a list, so get a bit of it. And the thing to remember here is that the first number that you define, the first index that you define will be included but the second one after the colon will not be included. So it's just inclusive on the first index and exclusive on the second. So from zero to three will give us z elements zero, one, two. I could have removed the zero since I want to start from the beginning. This is an example of a place where being implicit doesn't actually hurt understanding. I can do the opposite with the end and start from three, remember, inclusive to the end. And a good way to think about this is to think about the fact that if we concatenate um, the list that's from the beginning until three and the list that's from three until the end, we should get back the original list. I'm not sure about this comment. It got cut somehow, but um, you can reverse a list in place by calling the reverse method, member method. You can, same as you would assume multiplication to behave in relation to addition, 
for, you can use that for concatenation as well. So that's the list L plus concatenate with the list R, concatenate with the list R, so R twice. There are actually two ways to sort a list. You can sort it in place. And that uses the sort method that is available for a list. And again, remember that you can always run interrogation on an object. And you get the doc string and it says, sorts the list in ascending order. It gives you additional um, parameters for the function. And it will tell you that the sort is in place, meaning that the list itself is modified. It doesn't return a new list, but it changes the list in place. Now there's a different function that's called sorted. And if we actually call interrogation on sorted, it will tell us that this returns a new list. And if we run that, if we print R and sorted R, we'll see that it does indeed sort the list, but the list itself hasn't changed. And this, again, like length, it's a function that's available for Python objects for which it would make sense to sort them. Okay, moving on from lists. Again, you can run dir on a list to see what other methods you would expect to see. You can pop elements, you can insert elements, you can reverse, remove, sort, just run interrogation mark after your function of interest and you'll get information about that. Okay, moving on to dictionaries. It is a mapping between keys and values. So in this particular one, I'm mapping the string one to the integer one, the string two to the integer two, and the string three to the integer three. And I can, using a specific key, retrieve the value which is assigned to it. I can add to a dictionary. So I define a new key, a string 90, and I assign the value integer 90 to that. I can, for a given dictionary, call keys, and that will give me all the keys that are available. I can call values, see the values. I can iterate over the keys. This is just a key, by the way. It's not a new list or anything. So if you modify the original dictionary, the dict keys object and the dict values object will change. Oh, okay. I did not know that. So this is proving to be in a useful session for me as well. Thank you. And again, we can run dir on numbers to see the copy command as well. And pay attention to what Yannick said before about copying dictionaries and needing to actually use the deep copy module. Uh, only if you nest multiple dictionaries. Mm -hmm. You can also use the get method. Let us numbers, which is a useful numbers to uh, a useful method to use if you're not sure whether a key exists. You can get let's try ninety, and it returns ninety. But let's try returning. 80 and it doesn't do anything that's because it's returning none we can tell it to return uh, five oops it's 
no, the keyword argument, and it will return the default value of five. Sorry about that. But if I was to use the normal indexing, it will give me an error. So a way to retrieve things if you don't care, if they don't exist, might be to use the get method, for example. Okay. We can also use the curly braces like the dictionaries, but without specifying any values to them, and then Python will understand those as sets, the way you know them from math. If I print primes, and if I, this will tell me it's a set. Of course, I can also use the constructor. Whoops. It has to be a tuple or an iterable. And it also return the same thing, but Python will understand what we mean if we just give it the curly braces. And once we have two sets, we can figure out the union of both primes and odds, the intersection, the difference, and the symmetric difference. Something that might be interesting is, for example, if I define this set of strings, one, four, and 20, and I go back to my keys of the dictionary, which I computed using dot keys, which as Yannick said, it's a view on the dictionary keys. This thing right here, that behaves like a set. And this is another example of duck typing in Python. And if you just search for duck typing and accept the, you'll see what is meant by duck typing. It's basically the concept of, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like, quacks like a duck, then it must be a duck. And what this means in the, in the context of Python is that it's not the type of an object that determines whether it can do something or not, it's whether it has defined these methods. And as it happens, K has defined the methods that are needed for sets to operate, so K can act like a set. So we can assume that K is a set because it quacks like a duck and it just walks like a duck, so it must be a duck. So and, or, difference, and symmetric difference. Any questions in the chat? So far, nothing. Ah, oh, there's a question. Where was K defined? That was the dictionary keys view, right? So yes, indeed. If we scroll up a bit, we see it. Yeah, in the dictionary section, we defined our numbers dictionary and we ran the keys method, and that returns an object of type dict keys, which is just basically all the keys, the string keys dictionary. Yeah. And the fact that it behaves like a set should tell you that keys have to be unique. If I, if I were to redefine this with a different number, then it would be replaced. I added it here. I assigned a new value. Dictionaries are mutable, so you can change them. And you can add as many. I can add a new member, 100. Whoops, now numbers is a set. Oh, you used to say name later. Yeah. Let me redefine this. And if I look at my dictionary right now, we'll see that it's now bigger than the original definition because I added these two values to it. And if I run dictionary.keys, it'll give me all the keys. Someone asks, is this a de definition or a declaration? Is what? This here? 
suppose. I don't think the distinction really makes sense in Python, right? So in C, for example, you can announce to the compiler that, uh, let's say, a function with a certain name exists without actually specifying the, the function. That would be the declaration then. In Python, I believe you always do both at the same time, right? Yeah, so it's just the definition because you're just adding a value to the set or to the dictionary. If you're talking about the variables, then you always do both at the same time. Mm. There's no such thing as declaring a variable without defining it. Yeah, and the type itself doesn't care about this thing here because we can change it whenever we want the type is related to here, to this thing. So it's just both, I suppose. And another question, somebody wants to know if we can exchange keys and values in the Python dictionary. Yeah, sure. Um, we demonstrate that later, but what you can do is you, you mean take this and have one be the key and string one be the value? Yeah, because exactly. what that's, dictionaries that's... allow us to do is to run this command, which is items, which returns a list of tuples. And well, we will talk about this in can, a bit. You, but you, you can construct a new dictionary from that, but you have to be careful because the values don't have to be unique. Yeah, I would for for that particular thing. I was I would use a dictionary comprehension. I would do something like dk for sorry for e value n, and that defines a new dictionary. And we'll learn about what this notation means in a when we talk about comprehensions. So this second. will break if you have two times the same value. Oh yeah, for sure. So but you will, will it or will it just uh, to, finally to override it? And... Let us try to break it. Um, okay, let's do numbers of uh, hundred equals a hundred. So now numbers has these two things that both want to be keys in this. And you just lost it, the value. Yeah. yeah. And whatever, this is something happens to come last, right? When, yeah. And this is something to pay attention to because I would have liked to know about this, but Python didn't tell me. And there will be a lot of errors when you code that will just go unnoticed and will just reveal themselves like four or five steps later um and you also cannot do that if the value is not hashable so if you have indeed a list yes. of value it will just throw an error mm -hmm. yeah so just to dissect what is happening here um if I do for KV in number of items, actually no, if I do for thing in number of items print thing, and I iterate over this list of tuples, it will give me every tuple. This is a Python tuple. And there is something you can do with Python tuples, which is called unpacking, which is say I have A equals the tuple one, two, three, four, and I I can unpack it like so B D E F I don't I don't know what happened to my alphabet there but it's gone now B, <laughs> now B is one D is two E is three and and, and uh, F is four what that allows us to do is unpack key and value at every point in the loop. So I have these now. And I'm using this fancy notation to define a new dictionary using this loop. An another way to unpack is if I want to unpack one into B and the rest into C, which is what comes after B. I can run, I can use this notation and it will unpack 
C into a list and B will take the value one. Um, this is useful because the return types of functions are often tuples. If your function returns multiple things, it will be a tuple. So you can have something like, I don't know, if you have a function that returns speed and position, you can unpack it and um, check its value just by running f of x, function of x. And if it returns a tuple of speed and position, you can unpack it into speed and position. And just to demonstrate something that I mentioned earlier, since this doesn't actually exist and I want to keep it as an example, if I run escape on this cell to go into uh, command mode and I press M, that turns the cell into markdown, press enter again, I can add something like markdown commands for displaying code and this will display my code as text if you want to explain in your report or in so where were we nearing the end i won't actually go into too many details in terms of control flow. It's pretty self-explanatory. This is how you write a control flow with elif, the keyword if you have multiple else if conditions. Um, I'm not sure I have nothing further to add to that. It's quite um, intuitive. I don't know if Yannick or Michael have some gotchas or some tips for control flow, but it's pay attention to the colon. Pay attention to indentation because again, Python cares about that. If we select go control left bracket, right, indents it, we can indent the whole thing if we wanted to put that inside a function. But in terms of the actual code, it's pretty self explanatory. If we change this to 15, it's this condition that will be met. And if none of them are met, then it's the else. Hmm. How do we get to the else branch, for example? Um, let's give it a list. Nope. We're not allowed. So I can think of uh, one way. Strength maybe that could also be. Uh, see, this is the uh, thing. <laughs> I'm. It the, the this truthy versus falsy thing just bit me because yeah. although it's, it's just I, I'm not sure if a string will actually be comparable with an integer. No, it won't. Mm. So so there's one way at least I can think of that works, but maybe this is also a question for the audience if you have been yeah. following along. I think I might. Mm. So we're looking for something that allows all these numerical comparisons, right? And that is neither equal to nor greater than nor less than zero. I might have it. I'm not sure, to be honest. No suggestions from the audience so far, though. That's also kind of a trick you, question, maybe. Are you thinking about none? Yes. Uh, uh, not none. No, that won't work because of the comparisons. Uh, because of the greater or less than, but something that sounds very similar. <laughs> so there's this, uh, this this special floating point number called man, right? Not a number. Uh, and that, that do I have? Here. You, do you, I have uh, to import it from the, from NumPy? Uh, no, you can just use uh, uh, float. Uh, so the the float constructor. Oh and give it the string then, and then it will work. Yes. Look at that. I would have never gotten to that. I wonder if the NumPy, doesn't NumPy have a NAN? I think so, yeah. Huh. I'm 
does the same thing. Okay. Okay, but let's keep it standard library for now. It's very interesting. And this is good to know, I guess, because you might run into this if you make some uh, mistakes in your calculations in machine learning models as well. Oh yeah, none is definitely something that will mess up your algorithms. Positive or negative inf for infinity is also such a case, but that oh. will always trigger the, the second or the third one. Right, yeah. I wonder if the float constructor teaches you that and it's uh, convert a string at a number to a floating point number, but it doesn't tell you that you can do. Okay, then that's knowledge that you'd have had to have. I didn't personally know you could declare NAN like that. Wait, and is this like a, does this, uh, yeah, it's a float. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another extremely useful type of control flow came in PEP 308. PEP, as we said, is the forum in which people suggest things. And this is called a conditional expression or a ternary operator that lets you either return or assign a value with the conditional expressed within it. And I've, it might be counterintuitive what Guido van Rossum finally decided the syntax should be, but if you use it enough times, then it will make sense. In this, in this case, I'm defining a variable, I'm, I'm assigning to x the value x equal f if true, x if true, if a specific condition is met. And if not, I'm providing a different value to be assigned to x. So this allows us to assign to x something that fits this conditional flow. As an example, let's suppose we have a condition called sun is shining or sun shining and we set that initially to false. And we say that I want x to be 35 if the sun is shining and else want it to be minus four. And since it's false, you can probably guess that it will be minus four. Now if I change that to true, then it will change accordingly. And that's extremely useful for returns. If you're extremely lazy like me, and you can just return a ternary operator, depending on a certain condition that is met by your function, either in its arguments or in the body. And if you define that, and you call it on true, then it's 35. And if you call it on false, then it's minus four. Right, moving on to loops, unless there are questions in the chat. No questions so far. Okay, loops, we've been implicitly using them all the time. So again, most important thing, most commonly the error will be that you forget this colon or that you'll end up incorrectly. Actually, um, Jupyter would indent for you. So if I do something like um, for i in range five, and I enter the colon, and that gives Jupyter the context to know that, okay, now it's a different level. So it indents for me. Printello and it does that five times. I can also print the actual uh, thing that is being iterated on, because in this case, the range, but I could also do it with the members of the list if I'm iterating over that. Now, if you need to iterate over something that by nature is what is called an iterable, and in Python, an iterable is, again, considering duck typing is anything that implements the, um, the iteration API. So you can iterate over lists, you can iterate over th um, 
strings. You can iterate, we saw over the dictionary. Um, Maybe you can show the, the type of range of five. Oh yeah, that's, that's an interesting that's thing. List. Yeah, that's true. If I run range five on its own, it's an object. It's not evaluated. It's it's a lazy thing. It's meant to allow you to run range of a trillion, for example, without breaking your computer, as long as you actually break at some point. And if, I, as Yannick says, we run we, we run the type. It's a range. And if we want to actually um, evaluate it, we would explicitly tell Python to evaluate it as a list. So I can do something like for i and range, I don't know, two to the gazillion, which would probably break my computer, print i, and then some other code, and then break. Oh, it actually breaks. I think my it takes some time to, to evaluate this exponential. Ah, uh, yeah, that is a good point. Because the, the big int that Python uses do actually take up some memory. Yeah, if you, if you did this with a list comprehension, you would actually fill up your memory right now. <laughs> okay, so I will run Control C, um, um, Shift Enter. No, what was it? Control C, but it won't break. Uh, I think oh, I in the... command mode. I don't. I don't know about Control C. In, in the yeah. notebook. So I was able to do that. I'm not sure what did it, but it was either the the stop button right here or the let us give it an end that it can. So that it just prints that. And what I wanted to show here is that if you want to iterate over something that you can iterate over, you can use the enumerate command. And let's just do thing for now. We don't know what it will return. And if I run enumerate on, actually, no. Which is also lazy, by the way. Oh, OK. In ABC, let's print thing to see what it is and it's a tuple it's a tuple and it's the index that's being returned as well so we can unpack it like we saw so index item and we can do whatever we want with that and as Yannick points out it's a lazy thing so it won't be evaluated until it's being actually Called. So you can force it into a list. But unless you do that, it won't be evaluated. These are just classic examples that use basic arithmetic. This showcases the continue keyword, which when met will interrupt just the current iteration of the loop, but will go right ahead and continue until the, to, until the outer loop is finished, but it won't do anything else. If you had break here, then it would be a condition that would just break the loop it's currently in, but not an even outer loop, if that makes sense. Did that make sense? No objections, so I suppose I did. Okay. So this is printing everything in range 20, so up to 19, that doesn't divide with 2. Similarly, you can define while loops like you would in any other language. You can use a while loop to append items to a list that starts out as an empty list. So we have this empty list here, and any list can call the append method. 
and that changes the actual object itself. And if we do that, and we print our list, maybe someone could tell us what this list now contains. So anyone with an idea, please come forward. At the risk of spoiling the thing, it's naturally the Fibonacci sequence, which gives us a nice segue into the functions section. There were actually two people who guessed correctly. But I'm not sure if nice. they might have looked ahead. <laughs> Well, look, looking ahead would have been very Pythonic in any way. Correct. This showcases how we would define a function. We have defined many functions. Functions don't have to return anything. You don't have to define any types. You could, that is, since Python, I'm not sure which um, version you can provide hints just to tell people what your function returns and what it operates on. But in general, you don't have to define anything other than the function's arguments. You can define def you can define default values. If I execute that using Shift Enter, call Fibonacci, get me the ten first items of that pr pr progression. I can change the parameters. I could also, for example, use this notation. The actual thing that's written here doesn't matter. What matters is the asterisks that both double and any and all um, named arguments. Um, uh, regular arguments and the double Asterisk refers to named arguments. So this will make sense when I run this example. So in this sense, args will contain everything here, one, two, three, and keyword arguments will contain a dictionary corresponding to this. To so these two. Question, to use variables from a function in another function, it needs to return the variable, right? Um, there is no such thing as returning a variable and you only return a value. Or um, if it's a complex type, a mutable type, then the reference to that value. So the scope uh, isn't shared between functions. Yep. So to re-demonstrate that, if I define a tuple of inputs and of keywords, I can unpack those into function arguments here and return them accordingly. Python yeah, also someone is, uh, sorry, someone mm -hmm. was asking for an example of uh, using variables from a function in another function. Um, so um, I don't see whether that is possible actually. Well, it depends on the context of the function. If both functions are in different modules or next to each other, then you can only call one from the other and use the return value. If you define one function inside the other function, then the outer scope will be available in the inner function. Sure, yeah, right. So in general, you can only access variables from you know, higher scopes, right? Uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand what, what the behavior that, it, what behavior we're after here. You can define two functions next to each other mm -hmm. and then they can call each other and use their respective return values. You mm -hmm. cannot use any function, uh, any variables directly from the other function, though, because oh, the yeah. variable is constrained to the function scope. 
Yeah. Well, if you define one function and inside this function you define another function, then the in inner function can use the outer function scope. Mm -hmm. well, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, I, I can't type this right now, but uh, if you have a variable outside a function, then you can use it inside the function. Uh, but if you assign a value to it, then you will create a new variable inside your own scope. But if you use global before, then you signal the Python interpreter that this is not a new variable, but you're actually assigning to the outer scope. Um, maybe Chris um, can type that down to. Yeah, sure. Um, if I'd first try to look up if the global keyword. Hmm. That's just a keyword, it's not a function. It is. Um, if you could guide me, I could type yeah, whatever just to, it to is. Def define a, a variable and assign it a value. Yeah, yep. and then define the function where you print this value. Uh, um, uh, no, the take? Just, just the variable from the outer scope. To, yeah, okay. Exactly. So and then you call the function. So that works. But if you if you assign the value inside the function, it will be a new variable. So it will print four, but if you print i, then from the outer scope it will still be five. Mm -hmm. However, if you uh, say global i inside the function, then it will point to the exact same variable. Now you have to use, say, global i and then i equals four. Oh. Two statements. Function four and print is four. I have never used that keyword. This is only important if you assign things. If if this is, for example, a list or anything, you can still mutate the list without using global. Oh, okay. List. Very interesting. This this will, uh, as it's written now, it will be the same i as the outer scope. Uh, if you assign a value here, it's the same thing. It will be a new variable. But you can you cannot direct if if you if you define a new variable in function and try to use it from function b, that doesn't work. You can only only access from the same scope or from the outer scope. I must be doing something wrong here because if I run global i and then change i to 3 in fun b, it does. It's 3 now. But ah, oh, because yes. function is free doing it. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. I'm going to try to move this, try this again. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. All right. Um, you, where were we? Okay, lambda functions. You can also define anonymous functions in Python and pass those around since even, even functions or objects, you can do something like add is equal to this anonymous lambda function which takes two inputs and returns the sum and we can now call it on one and two. And the reason you would need something like that is sometimes um, some functions will take as their arguments other functions. For example, the sorted function that we saw earlier, if we call it on a list of strings, it will by default sort things alphabetically, but that's just a semantic decision. You can decide to define the fact that a list is sorted differently. And 
what we do here is we use an anonymous lambda function to say that we want length to be the sorting factor. And we do that by taking a function that takes in an input, which is the list element, and the output is its length, and it will sort thing according sort things according to length. The, the you will Pep Linter will scream at you in cell 177 though. <laughs> because you shouldn't shouldn't assign a lambda to a function, you should use a name function. This here. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's possible, but it's not. Oh, okay. The equivalent would be a function add. Mm -hmm. So we just learned that this thing is not Pythonic. So you will definitely want to avoid this thing here. Uh, only use lambdas if you need an anonymous function, like in the sorted uh, yeah. scenario. Yeah. If anything, this just showcases the fact that functions are just objects that you can pass around. But uh, yeah, don't do that if you're writing code that other people are going to have to use. Um, right. A few more things from the standard library, the math module, which provides you access to logarithms, both natural and binary. You can access constants. And you can just look up the documentation to see everything that is to import from the math module. The random module allows you to, um, well, do pseudo random number generation. So there is a function in this, mo in this module called choice, which we can call on a list. And it will just pick one item of the list. And if we run it again, it will pick cat, apple, apple, cat. Another standard library module is the URL lib module, which you can use for HTTP requests. For example, we send a request to Wikipedia to get the Python page, we decode the response and print a few characters of that to screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, another useful module is the iter tools module. And if you open the documentation for that, it's actually a lot of iter tools Python. You will see visual examples of what you can achieve with the iterator in this cell and its output for a, an example in this cell. So if you cycle through an iterable, it will just keep giving you the same thing infinitely until you break it. You can repeat things, you can accumulate things, you can chain things. This is an extremely useful um, resource if you want to create some behavior but you're not really sure how to do it chances are it can be done here and it has been done. Lots of examples as usual with the documentation. So we'd recommend you check that. Um, an example with permutations, this allows us to create um, two tuples out of this list with no repeated elements. You can also combine. And for more things you can do with iterative tools, you can just go to the documentation and have a look at the examples there. And the final thing we will cover today is, in my opinion, <laughs> the most Pythonic of all the expressions, which are comprehensions, specifically, for example, first list comprehensions, which allows us to do something like this. And it's something that you have to get used to. And once it clicks, it clicks. It's iterating over this for n in range 11, so from 0 to 10. And it's forming a list with this item. This item is telling the list how it's to be constructed. So if I change this item, if I do 1 for n in range 11, 
then it will repeat one 11 times. I can also do something like n plus one for n in range 11. And again, this is the value that is used to construct the list. And if we combine that with the permutation that we saw earlier, if we create this permutation, we put it in the list perms, uh, in the iterable perms, and we iterate over it for p in perms, and we take just the elements as they exist in that iterable, then we can create a list of these tuples of permutations. We can do all sort of things, sorts of arithmetic things. Power two. We can also add conditions on the iteration, and we do that after the iteration. So this would mean that you iterate over range 11 and only consider it if it doesn't divide by three and turn n in that case. Three and six are gone. We can also use a condition on the value that is returned using the ternary operator that we saw before or conditional expression. And if we add that, then this thing here removes the three and the six. And this thing here is set to the value of n as it was in the original, original range. If it doesn't divide by two, otherwise it's minus n. You can also define more complex things like return of value as a tuple. You can change this to anything you want. 100, 2 times n. And you can do the same thing with dictionaries. If we take this list of tuples that we just defined here, and we want to define this as the key and this as the value, now we have to pay attention to the fact that it might break because, again, keys have to be unique. If we use curly braces instead of the square brackets, now the value has to be in dictionary form, so key.value. And if we iterate over this list of tuples, and we saw that we can unpack a tuple by just assigning to A and B, then we can define a dictionary in that way. Now these are just random names. As we saw, these names don't mean anything. It can be this. Our original dictionary and the question that came earlier on whether we can invert things and we'd use a list comprehension for that, the dictionary comprehension, excuse me. And we can do the thing that we already did a while ago. So this is iterating over this list of tuples. Numbers of dot items returns a list of tuples. We unpack them into a variable k and v, and we define a new dictionary with the key as v and the value as k. You can do the same thing with sets. And that's it for this tutorial. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Chris. So far, I don't see any questions. Maybe we can wait a little bit in case somebody is typing one out right now. Mm -hmm. Again, the Stack Overflow in the Moodle is also a good place to ask Python questions. It doesn't have to be questions about the lecture. It can be questions about Python. It can be questions about Jupyter.